So when you say it showed me, what do you mean by that? And the visuals it gives me is as clear as watching a movie on Netflix. So you're literally seeing uh, the life that you should be living as opposed to the one that you're currently living through this Brian Keane movie. That's exactly what happened with the first experience that I went with. It was like, do you know when you're watching Netflix, Brendan, and you can flick through Netflix for the different shows and TV shows and comedies and dramas, but it was all the experiences of my life up until that point. And I could click play and then I could rewatch them as an adult. But that's what it was like Brilliant. for me. Brian, you're very welcome back to the Scalax Insider podcast. I'm really, really thrilled to have you back again on the show. Brendan, pleasure is all mine. I'm absolutely delighted we're back. I had an amazing time on round one, and I know we're going in a slightly different direction today, so really excited for it. Brilliant, me too. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Now, I'm going to test you because it was a couple of years since you were last on. You have, and I've been following your journey, you have experienced some incredible things over the last two years, and no doubt you've, in, you've gained 10x the wisdom. So, you know our vision is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small to medium-sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So, Brian, I open up the show with this question to all of our guests. What does scaling with purpose mean to you? I think it's similar to my answer before because my overall mission hasn't really changed in the grander scheme that, you know, the quote I live my life by is, don't forget the flowers at your feet when you're reaching for the stars or reaching for the moon. And as I scale with purpose, it's making sure that I'm giving back and that I'm leaving and giving more than I'm taking. And I've tried to double down on that over the last couple of years. I've been very fortunate with it and I've been able to grow with social media, with revenue. I set up a separate consultancy business in the new year, which has been going tremendously well because the fitness business is at scale now and runs itself more or less. And I've been able to hopefully continually serve people in a meaningful way as I did that and to stay focused on that North Star has been the goal and continues to be the same goal. Lovely Brian it was exactly the same the last time with a with a little bit of nuance there and I've just finished wrapping up the season 12 with Claire the wonderful Claire and giving was a strong theme coming from that season. I interviewed Bob Berg, the author of the wonderful Go Giver series, which is incredible. And uh, it seems paradoxical, but the more we, we serve in business, actually, the more profitable we become as a result. So I love that. Look, I'm keen. It has been two years since, since we last spoke. What have been some of the big wins for you since then? The big business wins is that everything has continually grown in a nice and steady trajectory. The podcast, which was even at the time, the Brian Keane podcast, one of the top health podcasts in the world has grown even more since then, partly down to having tremendous guests. I would love to be able to take a lot of credit for that. And yes, holding the space and being able to have a platform that goes out there for people definitely helps. But I've been very lucky with guests that have allowed me to continually grow. The fitness business, social media has continually proven to be a place to put out a positive message, which I said several years ago that I wanted social media to be a more positive place because of the content I was creating. So I don't call people out. I don't do any nasty videos. I don't do anything along those lines. And I'll take the hit at smaller growth to serve my community if I'm doing it the right way. And then in the new year, when I set up the consultancy business, which is basically working with personal trainers, physiotherapists, health, fitness, online businesses to grow and scale. That has been uh, something that was probably the best decision I've made in business in a very long time. It's giving back. I started to come across a lot of coaches, not to knock anyone directly, but I've had experiences myself working with business coaches who very clearly didn't do it for the right reasons and said yes to me when they shouldn't have. And I wanted to be a bit of an antithesis to that and provide and serve people and give back in a way that could help them grow and scale by pulling out their story and being able to serve their tribe as opposed to just being something that turns over money 
and where you feel a bit icky putting your head down at the pillow at nighttime. And I've been able to grow that, scale that over the last several months. That's just me at the minute. I have my fitness business and my staff who work on that. The consultancy is just me at the minute, but it's been incredible. I've loved working with the entrepreneurs that I've worked with. And it's something that I'm going to continually double down on for the rest of 2024 going into 2025 next year. You're living the dream, my friend. You've got the the asset that's continuing to deliver for you. You've invested a huge amount of time, effort, and and uh, blood, sweat, and tears in your fitness platform. And I'm delighted to hear that that's really delivering for you now. I know you're serving the business community, and uh, I think you're being incredibly modest in the context of the podcast being, you being lucky with the podcast in the context of the guests. I encourage everyone to get over and listen to Brian's podcast. Incredible you, uh, you're an incredible host and certainly somebody that I'm inspired by. So um, I had Daniel Priestley on the show a number of uh, months back and he said, the more we continue to serve others as leaders, the greater our surface area of luck becomes. So I think you've you've created a very wide surface area of luck, my friend. So well done. Look, this season we're focused on all things health and well-being of the business leader. And you've mentioned you're serving now the business community extensively. So let's kick off. When the business leaders come to you for your support in relation to all things health and well-being, what do you see as the common challenges, the common issues that they're coming with? There's two. It's interesting because I work primarily with health, wellness, and fitness businesses, and they tend to have two separate struggles. One is in the health, fitness, and wellness space themselves, where they normally end up trying to give from an empty cup, and they can't stay on top of their own health, fitness, and wellness because they're trying to grow their business, scale their business. The other is actually more of a business problem. It's not being able to rise above the noise and ultimately pull out their story, the thing that makes them unique and leaning into that to serve their community and their tribe. And it's the combination of both. I try and work with my entrepreneurs and business leaders that you have to look after yourself first and foremost, your sleep, your fitness, your movement, your nutrition, all of this feeds directly into your business. And you're asking what are your true force multipliers, your sleep that leads to better food choices, which leads to better movement patterns, which gives you better brain activity, which leads to more creativity and all of these things. And then using that to potentially serve whoever it is you're trying to serve, whether it's the product or with a service, but pulling out a story that's what i have been leaning into and have used and have evolved since we spoke last of leaning into your story that's what's made my podcast i won't say grow exponentially because it hasn't it's been very linear and then it grows in massive trajectories when you get a big guest who will come on and it just lifts the whole brand of the show and then the downloads go up etc but it's leaning into the story either trying to pull out the story from a guest as an interview host or pulling out my story my background my issues with trauma my issues with childhood my issues with ibs or my issues with fitness or disordered eating patterns and pulling out that story to make it and it's authentic to me because it's what I went through and connecting with the people who that speaks directly to. And that effectively allows you and any business leader to rise above the noise online because you're connecting with your individual tribe. You don't need to speak to everybody to have a big podcast or have a social media platform that does well. You just need to speak to the perfect people. And I try and get my business leaders to look after themselves in terms of their health and wellness and then focus on pulling out their story and their message so that they're getting the best of all worlds when it comes to their business and their life. That's a really interesting perspective. I didn't expect you to uh, to come back with that, that on one side it's ensuring that their cup is full, but on the other, what I'm hearing in terms of them sharing their story is that essentially they're being authentic. They're, uh, now, when you say, can you share a little bit more what you mean by kind of rising above the noise? And coupled with that, would you encourage every business leader to share their story regardless of whether they're um, comfortable with social media or are appealing to that audience on social media or not it's a great question brendan the answer with the sharing the story is no i don't think everyone needs to share their personal story or even their professional story i think to be successful in business you have to be able to story tell in some capacity i think all the best brands do this apple 
are probably some of the best storytellers ever when it comes to thinking differently. You've got Coca-Cola, you've got all your top in brands, your Nikes who have a representation and an image and an idea, but they're storytelling all the way along. And you can do that in a micro element if you're on social media or your business owner either telling your professional story the things you struggled with you know you do this with scale x you're talking about this was mistakes i made these were areas that i should have looked at earlier and i didn't here's how you avoid it that's effectively storytelling because you're bringing out an experience that you had that didn't serve you in terms of what you were looking to achieve at the goal and other people are at a similar starting point and they're thinking oh actually i can avoid this mistake because brendan made it this is great content that's storytelling and I think it's a very important thing to do. Whether you choose to do it is very much down to you as an individual. I've been a long-term subscriber that my mess becomes my message. And I've been able to write books, do podcasts, create videos, leaning into that. Because ultimately, like if you see yourself as a vehicle of service to try and make the world a little bit of a better place because you're here, it makes it easier to lean into that because all the discomfort and that, oh, what will people think kind of goes away when you're effectively coming back to some form of a North Star with, I want the internet, I want the world to be a bit better because I was here. And then you get out of your own way, you let go of that ego, you stick with that authentic self, and then you just get into the habit of leaning into that more and more. Yeah, I love that. It's, you know, that notion of getting over yourself in order to serve others. And this is where having a compelling purpose aligned to a North Star, as you talk about, you know, knowing where you're going, who it is you want to serve, but importantly, why you want to serve them. And certainly the, the deeper the foundations of your reasons why, the, uh, the, the easier it is for you to get motivated on those dark Wednesdays in November, especially in Ireland, <laughs> when it's lashing outside and you're wondering, why am I doing this? And you've got to have some, some, um, a, a strong account of, of, uh, deposits of reasons in there in order to, to motivate yourself to continue to go on. You I might add, I might add to that, Brendan, just, you just made a really good point. It's something that I've been thinking about recently, which might be valuable is motivation and a lack of motivation comes from misalignment. And the more aligned you are with your mission and who it is you're trying to serve and what you're trying to do, the more motivated you'll be. And a lot of people think that, okay, I get motivated and then I'll serve and this is the order, when in reality it's not. If you're in alignment with what you should be doing, you end up jumping out of bed every morning and excited to serve the world in a meaningful way. And that's not, there's not to say there's not days when I'm like, oh, Wednesday, it's rainy and it's November and it's dark. But most of the time I'm jumping out of bed and anytime that motivation goes away, it means I'm out of alignment. That's why I set up the consultancy in the new year because the fitness business to me, I was loving it and I love fitness is a huge part of my life, but I can legitimately answer probably any follow-up question you ask me with health or wellness and fitness at this stage. I've been doing it for more than a decade. I'm very well qualified and certified in the areas that I'm in. I know my market. I know their problems. And I was getting a little bit bored in that space because it just doesn't interest me as much to serve in a really in-depth way because I can't sink my teeth into it because I legitimately know the next answer. When I'm working with someone in business, there's a million different areas you can go in and it allows me to get excited about who I'm working with. My motivation comes from that alignment and following that inner voice and being that authentic self and leaning into it. And that hard part is finding that, getting in alignment because once you do, the motivation comes with it. The order is actually, people think it's, you know, misunderstood, fall into alignment and the motivation comes with it. I'm so glad you stopped me before I went on. In the context of alignment, how does misalignment show up in the body? How is it expressed in the body? So how will we know? How will we, how will we tune in? And if we're ignoring it, what, what is the ultimate manifestation of that in the body? For, I'm a focus group of one here, but I can use myself as an example. Normally it's an external response on an internal or an internal feeling of laziness and procrastination. That's normally how I check in with it. If I'm procrastinating a lot or I'm regularly going, wow, I'm so lazy. I have to ask myself, actually, am I out of alignment with what I should be doing here? Now, there is a time and a place when you have to cultivate self-discipline. I talked about this on the first episode that disciplined people do 
the thing they have to do, whether they want to do it or not. And writing a book is a great example of that. Nobody wants to sit down and edit a book for, you know, 50 hours or write a book for another 12, 12 to 24 hours and go back on another draft. But sometimes you have to do because your future self will thank you for it. And there is an element of tapping into that self-discipline. That's not out of alignment. Sometimes you can procrastinate on that and you need to get yourself into a mentally well health headspace, have a cup of coffee, set up an environment where you can sit out and do the thing you have to do regardless of how you feel. But if that's happening all the time, and I'm constantly procrastinating and I'm constantly feeling like I'm being lazy. It's normally a sign that I need to check in with, am I aligned at what I'm doing now? And in most cases, once I kind of excitement is a feedback mechanism for me, I get excited. I get excited in my head. I get excited in my heart and I'm like, oh my God, that's what I want to do. It's the old adage and cliche that if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And I check in with that regularly and that excitement in my body gives me feedback. This is what I should be doing. When I set up the consultancy business in January and corporate speaking is something I'm doing a lot more of now this year, they were both hell yeses for me. They were, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm loving this. I get to speak in front of people and serve them in a way I like to communicate. And the consultancy was allowing me to sink my teeth into problem solving on an area that I can help people in a very meaningful way based on all my experience. They were hell yeses for me. There's been others. I set up a subscription business for the fitness business off the back end of 2022. And I was six weeks into that when I was like, oh my God, no, hard no. I was like, this, this is taking up too much of my time. It's making me not want to get out of bed every morning. It's actually not generating as much revenue compared to the amount of time I'm putting into it. And I cut the cord on that. There are two contrast points for check-ins because on paper, a subscription membership size fitness business based on where we're, where we're at makes a lot of sense. But in execution, as I followed it, I'm like, no, nope, I'm not enjoying this at all. So it's just going back and checking in with your body, checking in with how you're feeling. And if you're excited and you have that hell yes, that's normally a good starting point. How do you discern when the activities are hard because scaling is hard? And you know that, you know, it's a case of we got to keep digging here because I don't want to abandon the digging because I might only be 30 feet from gold, as it was cited in Napoleon Hill's book versus no, that I'm, I'm, I'm digging. I'm digging in the wrong place completely. There's no gold for me here. I regularly check in with the sunk cost fallacy and just ask myself the question. Your listeners will be familiar with the sunk cost fallacy of you know throwing bad, good money after bad and staying in a relationship or staying in a job or staying in something just because it's something you've always done or you've done it for five years, 10 years, et cetera. I regularly ask myself, if I was starting again from zero, would I go again today? And that goes from writing books, that goes from course creation, that goes for the subscription membership that we trialed. It was taking away all the time, energy, money, focus that I put into it and asking myself, if I was starting from zero today, would I still keep going? And that gives me a lot of feedback on whether I should continue doing it or not. Oh, that's a brilliant question. A brilliant question to ask yourselves. And I'm going to use that because uh, often you get challenged with discerning whether it's just challenging or actually I'm I'm in the wrong place. I need to be pivoting and doing something else. But uh, thankfully, I don't experience that in the journey that I'm currently on. I have to say, uh, everything we're doing is just incredible, and it's um, incredible because of the novelty. And, and it's it's all new: the podcast, the books, um, the the coaching programs, which is which is wonderful. And I can feel your energy. And I think of you know, CEO, the abbreviation CEO is chief energy officer, and you always bring incredible energy. You're on brand all the time. It's just brilliant. Uh, I get, uh, it's just infectious when I, when I feel that. And, and I really feel that it's incumbent on all leaders to bring that incredible energy to, to their business. You referenced it in the, the earlier question, but I, I want to just uh, really clarify for people what are the fundamental pillars of great energy? It's another great question because I've actually changed my mind about this a little bit in recent years. I, as somebody that self-identifies as a fitness person, and I'm a big fitness person, it's been a huge part of my life. I have a fitness company, but it's something that I have and is a huge part of my actual personal life in terms of my training. I always thought that nutrition and training were pillars for high energy. And they are. I think your sleep, your nutrition, and your movement patterns through the day are, from the physiological standpoint, they're going to cover what you need 
from an energy standpoint, but something, and I know we might get onto this later that some of the psychedelic medicines and plant medicines have taught me is that a lot of your energy can come from your mind in general. And it's interesting because I think back to 2014, 2015, when I'd been several years into what was a one-to-one personal training business at the time, I was eating really well. I was training a lot. I was sleeping okay, but my energy levels weren't great because I didn't have my mental health in check and I didn't have just my mindset right in general. And that made me question the belief system that just look after your nutrition, your movement and your sleep and your energy levels would be high because that's not true. I know a lot of people who have very good quote unquote fitness or even health and fitness and they're quite low energy individuals. There's probably a genetic component for sure with that. There's a personality component to that for sure. But also it comes back to what I mentioned there about the alignment and being excited about what you get to do every day. And that can be everything from the environment that you're in, the people that you're around, the work colleagues, the people you hire, if you're a business leader, the people that are in your day-to-day circle, whether that's friends and family members, because it only takes one drainer or emotional vampire or energy vampire to start taking some of your energy away from you. And something that I struggled with was a story that I had, I had a little bit of a Superman complex. I probably still do, Brendan, let's be fair. I think all entrepreneurs do to some capacity, but I had- What are you talking about, Brian? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's not a thing, not a thing. But I had that thinking I can do everything. And when I started to have a few people come into my life who were actually quite draining, meaning that they would take a lot of my energy just by either being negative or not being supportive, it made me think that it's not all health and fitness and nutrition and sleep-based. Your environment matters a great deal. And there's a, an old line, and I can't remember who it's attributed to, but I think it's a cognitive behavioral therapist that, you know, you can't heal in the same environment you got sick in. And if you're around people who are taking your energy and making you, quote unquote, sick, either that's just low energy or just actually physically sick, maybe you need to remove yourself from that. So I think it's very much a case of looking your life in a holistic way. It's, are you enjoying the work you're doing? Do you feel like you're of service to others? How are you showing up with your family? You know, I've got my daughter, my nine-year-old, who's like the closest person to me and she's the highest priority. So all the decisions I make come out of, okay, how do I want to show up as a dad? How do I want to be? Do I want to be physically present and emotionally present with her? I want to be able to guide her through this world. So I make decisions based on that. Not everyone listening will have kids. They might have another why or another reason or another anchor. But you want to make sure that you have everything in alignment, your health, your wellness, your work and being fulfilled in what you're doing, whether that's leading others or leading yourself and the family, friends and everything else, because it only takes one or two people or potentially one or two things to suck all that energy away from you. And it's very difficult to get it back from my experience. Incredible. Um, we're very much aligned in terms of my own experience. And I'm not, you know, I'm a practitioner of all things fitness, not say all things, but certainly it's how I've identified and certainly how I feel I've lived my life. And I remember things in acronyms. And I remember writing an article that, you know, this makes good sense, sense being an acronym for sleep exercise, nutrition, self-care, and environment. And I actually use that terminology, and certainly with my own clients, I get them to do an energy audit to assess the radiators and drains in their life. So the radiators, the energy radiators, who, who is that? Who, when we're having, you're an energy radiator, I could chat to you for hours, and you just, you, you're just gonna come away from the conversation like I did the last time, feeling, feeling really good, buzzing from it. There are other people that I can speak to for 10 minutes and I'm absolutely exhausted for the next hour. Uh, And I have been very, uh, ruthless is a a strong word, but certainly I've been very diligent in removing those drains from my life in in the last three, four years. And uh, I have a wonderful network of people who who are fertilizer to to what we're trying to do. So we're, we're very much aligned to it. You referenced psychedelics uh, in that last question. I'm really glad that you did because I've been really curious about your journey. I have listened to quite a number of your your podcast episodes and especially those episodes where you have gone deep uh, in regard to your psychedelic experience. 
just for the listeners, I'm going to give a little bit of context. The very, I would say the very first self-development book I came across that that spoke to me was uh, Robin Sharma's book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. And I was listening to an episode that you did, maybe with Robin Sharma at the time, and you mentioned that that was a trigger for you to say there is another way here. There's, there's something else in life that I've been missing and maybe I need to, to go down a different path. And it's interesting that you started there and I started, I still have the original copy of the, the book that I read. Um, I started there also and have been on this incredible journey, you know, that has taken me to, to Amsterdam to become a Wim Hof Method instructor to, into a completely different community. And I was in Croatia last year on an island with 200 entrepreneurs and there are quite a number of the speakers. It was for a week-long event, brilliant speakers, and just a coming together of people, sharing ideas, and just you know in, enjoying themselves, having some fun. And quite a number of the speakers are, were actually speaking to the the power of psychedelics in relation to boosting creativity, to supporting different thought patterns, to breaking out of it, the, the existing belief systems. Uh, all of this that I was deeply curious about and, and still I'm deeply curious about. I would love if you would share with our listeners uh, your exploration into psychedelics and that will open up lots of other questions, but I'm deeply curious as to, I suppose, the Brian on the other side of your psychedelic experience. I know this is a very open question, but we've never covered it on the podcast before, and it seems very apt. Steve Jobs has experimented. We know many others in Silicon Valley who cite their their wonderful idea and their their scaling success as a result of their psychedelic experiences. So would you be open to, to sharing your own experience, Brian? Yeah, 100%. I think it's something that I didn't realize the power of plant-based medicines and for anyone unfamiliar there's lots of different plant-based medicines and psychedelics can be you know that some people call them the same uh, and the experience and the journey that led me and we said right before we went on air i went through a phase in 2017 2018 when i first came across ayahuasca in particular that was my first plant-based medicine and i have a tendency to have analysis by over paralysis or paralysis by over analysis. I read every book I could get my hands on between the psychedelics explorers guide on LSD all the way up to Amazon based books with ayahuasca. I listened to the podcast and sufficiently freaked myself out proper scaredy squirrel and was like, no, I'm not doing that. I am not going into those traumas. I'm not going into any of this. I'm very and much in control here. I, I'm yeah. staying there. But that, that's when the irony of it, if all the psychedelics do or plant-based medicines do, and this isn't a recommendation, I actually definitely think there's a lot of people who shouldn't do this because they are a gateway to your subconscious that can be too much too soon and could potentially have a mental breakdown with. And I did my first ayahuasca ceremony it was three nights in a row three ayahuasca ceremonies in 2021 and the way it happened at the time was my girlfriend at the time who and we'd been going out for about a year and a half at this point she went the previous month and came back and had a very different energy and a very different feel in a good way in a very positive way at the time and tell I me remember about that what if, you know what what characterized different energy and a different feel she seemed to be just more content and happier in herself in that moment in time. And I thought to myself, we're on different wavelengths now. And I signed up to go that following month purely because I wanted the reconnection with her. And the first three nights were, I got nothing my first ever night because you can block these plant medicines. You can drink your ayahuasca cup. And for anyone that's unfamiliar with it, it's like Amazonian plants that are molded together to make a tea that you drink that can send you on effectively a psychedelic journey. And it's the analogy I use. And I recorded a solo podcast at the time. I actually had one of my friends interviewing me, but it was effectively a solo podcast talking through my experience with ayahuasca. 
And the analogy I use or the apologies, the description I used at the time was that it was like 10 years of therapy over three nights with a therapist that knew me better than I knew myself. And I got a disproportionate amount of benefit from some of the stuff that had helped me unpack. And it's basically just therapy on steroids if you let the plant medicine do the work. It'll show you what's going on in your subconscious. It'll show you why you think the way you think. From my experience, again, focus group of one, but it showed me why I had anxiety. It showed me why I would get overwhelmed and worried all of the time. And a lot of it came down to control. As you mentioned earlier, it was just the illusion of control that if I worried, I'd feel in control of the situation when in reality, it was just getting stored in my body and it was making me miserable. And I could choose to let this happen or I could choose to not let this happen. And that was fine for several months after. I had no call. I remember a friend of mine who had done ayahuasca said that when you get the call, answer the phone. But when you get the message, put the feckin' phone down. And that's how I felt off the back of the ayahuasca. I'm like, okay, I've got my message. I know now that I need to stop being all up in my head. I need to stop worrying about all these extraneous things that actually are just negatively impacting my life. And, but I didn't have any major dramatic life shifts because some people go to ayahuasca and they leave their husband or they leave their wife or they start a company or they quit their job. Ayahuasca for me, and I was back recently in October, November, which I got on to because those experiences were very different because of the circumstances in which I went. Ayahuasca would show you the path and show you if you're in alignment. It will show you if you should be doing what you're doing and if you shouldn't, it will explain that's not your path. That's not what you're meant to be doing. For me, that's what happened. I was in alignment with a lot of areas of my life at the time. I loved my work. I loved my partner at the time who I was going out with. I was had family first as a priority. So I didn't get any life-changing external changes when I came back. I didn't have to quit my job or start a new company or break up with my partner or leave my country or none of that because it was in alignment. I just felt a little bit less anxious and I was able to go through life in a more peaceful way. Last year, before you get into last year, sorry, I just I, yeah. just to capture so that that initial experience, you've said a number of times there. It showed me, it showed me. Now, uh, I want to ensure for the listeners that that isn't abstract and kind of some sort of spiritual message. So, when you say it showed me, what do you mean by that? It showed me in the sense that I had a blindfold on. And the visuals it gives me is as clear as watching a movie on Netflix. My God. So you're literally seeing uh, the life that you should be living as opposed to the one that you're currently living through this Brian Keane movie. Yes, that's exactly what happened with the first experience that I went with. It was like, do you know when you're watching Netflix, Brendan, and you can flick through Netflix for the different shows and TV shows and comedies and dramas? It was that, but it was all the experiences of my life up until that point. And I could click play and then I could rewatch them as an adult. Childhood issues, teenage memories, good, bad, indifferent. And I could flick through and then I could click them. And I could watch them again and I could relive them again. This is why it's so traumatizing for people. If you've been through emotional abuse or sexual abuse or physical abuse and you replay that event, sometimes the pause button gets broken and you can't get out of it. That's why people have traumatic experiences on ayahuasca. And again, is this incredibly lucid? Is it incredibly vivid? Like you're seeing yourself on a bike when you were six and you fell off and your, you know, your mom came out or what? Like, is it, is it really vivid? It's as clear as if I was sitting on my couch watching a Netflix series. It's as clear as that. It, th for me, not everybody's is, but my experience at the time was as clear. And I'm aware you have people that are all into the spiritual and this is the connection to source all the way down to our brains. Chemicals are making this up and everything in between. And the truth and the reality is, I don't know. I can only speak from my own first-hand personal experience, but that's what it was like for me. Yeah, So, so you went the first time uh, you had this incredible experience where you were able to see a movie of your life up until that point. And 
when you say then, so it showed, and I'm trying to think here, I'm going to put myself in your head here. Think you were watching a movie of your life what up until this point, and it, when it, you say it showed me the direction, what was it showing you that says, Brian, you're misaligned over here, you need to do this now? It showed me that the best analogy I could use, if we keep the movie metaphor, is when you haven't seen a movie before and you don't know what the Indian is going to be like, it would show me the multiple Indians and director's cut Indians if I kept living the way I was living now or if I went on another path. That's incredible, Brian. So you woke up out of this experience this is after you know maybe share with our listeners who have uh, no knowledge of this at all uh, explain it like you know i'm a 10 year old because that's essentially my knowledge of it i'm curious about it especially given what you've described and maybe that curiosity comes from a sense of again wanting to be in control, wanting a level of certainty. So having a movie of your life that says, um, "By the way, I'm nearly fifty now. Do this for the next ten years, as opposed to this, uh, with short circuit, a lot of challenges in between times." Is it as profound and pronounced as that in terms of what changes did you make when you came home in terms of? I was doing this and now I'm doing this. The, for those who aren't familiar with it, the best example I can give is if you remember when you were seven or eight years old and if you were lucky enough to have a parent in your life or a parental figure or a father or a mother figure where you thought they knew everything and they would say things that would just blow your mind as a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old because it was like mom or dad knew everything. It was like that experience again, but as an adult. And that's the best example I can give when it comes to the feeling as opposed to taking you through my individual experience and perspective of what happened for me during that. When it comes to the changes I made the first time it slowed me down I potentially was going to physically and mentally and emotionally run myself into an early grave because I historically have self-punished with exercise I tend to have a very type a personality with business and life in general very extreme very all or nothing and it showed me that if you keep doing this, yes, you have all the external successes, but you're going to put yourself into an early grave, which I kind of knew going in. I knew that the way I was living at the time, although a lot of external success in terms of the some of the traditional and maybe non-traditional ways in which we'd measure that revenue, money, status, et cetera, that was coming at a cost. And it just sh- slowed me down. It made me think that, okay, I don't need to do everything I need to pick a handful of things and do those really well. You mentioned Robin Sharma. I've got a quote on him here from when he was on the podcast about being world-class. It's right in front of me here. I listen to it and watch it or or read it every time before I do a podcast interview is be world-class. And it got me to focus more on less, if that makes sense. I picked less things, but I focused deeper on them. The only other dramatic change it made was it helped me to meditate. And I had spent three years, Brendan, trying to learn how to meditate. And I tried every app, every method, and I just couldn't get there. And what the ayahuasca showed me was this is your end goal for meditation. And I sit now, I meditate every day. And it's normally just me observing my thoughts and observing how Brian is feeling in terms of removal of ego state and trying to put yourself into a space where you're not consumed by the thoughts that are coming and not attaching to any of those thoughts. And the ayahuasca taught me how to do that. And it was kind of the example I use is like fitness. When you go to a personal trainer and they like beast you for a leg workout and you're like, wow, I never thought I could squat that weight or I never thought I could do that many reps on leg extension. 
I had the meditation equivalent of that. I'm like, okay, this is what the target is. This is what I can get to. This is the focus. They were the two main things that I got during that, those first experiences, which was three nights. But, you know, I've done 10 in total, but three nights over that three period of time. And it was Majorca where I did it. So two profound messages coming out of that. You know, the message to, to slow down or you're going to meet a very untimely uh, early exit from this, this wonderful life. And the other was the way to do that in many respects, which was to, to meditate, to learn to sit, to kind of um, uh, quieten this, this mind and this body of this restless kind of being that you are, to, to, to sit it down and to, to quieten it. And there, there are a number of things, there are a number of things coming up for me there. One is, you mentioned that intuitively you knew this going in. You knew that you needed to slow down. Do you feel now on reflection that your body was trying to tell you this anyway, but actually it was the experience of ayahuasca who, which kind of give you this lucid visual, this lucid instruction of what you intuitively knew I suppose what I'm getting at with that question is for those listeners who are saying, guys, psychedelics is not for me. It's not a journey I'm going to go down. I'm not even curious about it. I'm curious to see if we can share with them an, a way of getting insight which doesn't require them actually going on that journey. If you knew what it was that ayahuasca was going to tell you before you even went in, but you weren't listening. Yeah, I I don't think everybody should do ayahuasca. And I think part of the reason that it's such a powerful medicine is that the people that do it can bring stuff back and then share it with other people. And something that I've shared with my audience based on that experience was I've had a couple of traumatic experiences in my life, some emotional based, I had a little bit of sexual abuse mm -hmm. when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I really struggled with that for large portions of my life. I had a lot of toxic masculinity. I had a lot of repressed anger that just built in my body. And when I went to ayahuasca, and this would be the thing I hold forever dear because of it, it will relive and re-show you that experience, but it will also show you the alternative on what that experience should have looked like or how it would look if you weren't harmed in that way. And the analogy I give is you have the original movie, your abuse, emotional, physical, sexual, in my case, you get that story and that movie is always there, but there's a director's cut where it didn't affect your life, where you didn't get abused. And it doesn't mean the original story isn't there. It just means that it doesn't have control and power over you anymore because you have an alternative story that you can look at. And I had David Kessler on my podcast recently who's one of the leading grief and loss experts in the world. And he talked about healing, that healing doesn't mean you forget what happens, the death, the divorce, the abuse. You don't forget it. It just doesn't control your life anymore. And you don't make decisions based on that place. What the ayahuasca gave me was it gave me an alternative director's cut where my life didn't get all messed up because of that. And I didn't hold all this trauma and that event didn't happen. And all it did was it softened the story. And something I've used with clients that I've worked with in mentorship programs or people that I have conversations with who are stuck in this story, whatever it is, whether it is, uh, you know, big T trauma, small T trauma, and I get them to go, well, what would the perfect version of that story look like? You know, if dad showed up the way he needed to, if mom showed up the way she needed to, if the abuse didn't happen, what does that story look like? And instantly you tend to see this weight disappearing from people's face because they go, oh, actually, that would have been better. That, that would have not hurt as much. And you can do this all the way down to breakups. And, you know, I had a breakup last year and we were supposed to get married and it was heartbreaking for me at the time. And in some of those unsupportive memories, and I've been a long-term subscriber, that a lot of those unhelpful memories are just unprocessed and undigested experiences that we need to move through. 
drawing out alternative scenarios of what the situation should have looked like, it doesn't mean that you're changing reality, but you are changing the perspective and the weight that you're giving to it. And I still use that in my day-to-day -day life without any psychedelics. And I still use that with clients to paint alternative pictures and stories so that you can remove some of that loop and that weight that gets people stuck. And that was something I got from ayahuasca that I brought back that I now pay forward to people when I'm doing podcasts or working with them directly. It's incredible, Brian. I really, really appreciate you being so, so open and so vulnerable and sharing your story. For us in the context of scaling, it's why psyche is the very first principle, which either empowers the mindset of the leader, either empowers all of the other nine principles or actually disempowers and impedes them. And a big part of that is the story that the business leader is telling themselves. And as you're describing that, I'm thinking back back to the movie theme again, the movie metaphor, a movie called Sliding Doors. I don't know if you recall seeing that, you know, and the the lady who I think it was Gwyneth Paltrow, was it, who was who, you know, missed the missed the train that she was about to catch and kind of the, the movie runs off in one story and then the other part of that is she actually gets the train and the, and there's there's two stories running in that entire movie and what you've just described is kind of that sliding doors uh, concept or that metaphor where you're given a view to provide you with alternative narrative which helps you actually tell yourself a different story which ultimately as I'm hearing and as I'm feeling from you gives you this sense of relief and liberation and freedom that actually, well, that was a set of circumstances, but actually I can choose to see it in this way. Uh, that's so incredibly profound. So that was your first experience. You've had nine experiences, you've said, since uh, then. Uh, ten total, so seven so, since that first. Right. Three, yeah. Okay. So, oh, yes, of course, that was a week. That was that was three in that in that uh, in that retreat. And given those seven, um, why did you go back? I went back for very different reasons in. August of last year, me and my partner at the time split up and that was a relationship that I thought was in game for me. We were engaged. I thought we were getting married. I, that was in game for me. And after about a month of that split, when I understood that we were never getting back together again, I felt like there was a part of me missing and I spiraled out of control for me. It was the only time in my life that I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't work. I had to cancel podcasts and calls because I, I wasn't able to function. And I, either unlucky or lucky, I don't know what way you'd put in it, but I'd never had my heart broken as an adult. And based on some of the things that happened off the back end of that breakup, my heart was just shattered into a million pieces and it just broke me, just absolutely broke me, Brendan. And I couldn't function. And I remember... I was, and this is getting too deep so we can cut it out or change direction if we need to, but I was in October, early October, just on the bathroom floor in tears and I couldn't get back up. I just, I had no anchor apart from my daughter and I just, I see, and I wasn't suicidal or anything like that, but I was in so much pain. I just wanted it to stop and I couldn't stop crying and I was just, couldn't see a way out. I couldn't see an end to this heartbreak and this feeling and after what was probably two hours of lying on a bathroom floor, I got up, whether it was a voice, whether it was me telling me to get up or something else, I don't know. But I thought I need to go back to ayahuasca. I was like, I, I need to get back and see what's going on here. Why did all this get triggered and activated when in reality it was a relationship and, and I loved my partner at the time but our relationship dynamic wasn't good. The breakup was for the best at the time and it's considerably for the best now, 10 months on. But I was broken and felt so hurt that I couldn't function. And I, it was a Tuesday night and I messaged the shamans who did the ayahuasca a couple of years before because I did a podcast on it and they literally sold out all their Irish retreats for the rest of the year off the back of the podcast. So they're like, hey, Brian. And I was like, can I come over on Thursday, please, for your retreat? They're like, yeah, we'll find you a space. Um, and I went over and that's what led me back onto it. So I did October and I did November 
three nights in October, three nights in, in November to try and unpack why I had been disproportionately hurt by a relationship that I internally knew wasn't right, but I still couldn't function without. And so it led me back. It was horrible. A bad ayahuasca experience because time is so relative in the, in the psychedelic state. It's hundreds of years of torment if you're in that deep space and you can't get out of it. I experienced that, so it's why I don't recommend it generally without due diligence, but also don't recommend it lightly because it's horrible. A bad ayahuasca experience is terrifying and one of something you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. And that's what happened to me in the October, but I went back in the November and I got a lot of healing, a lot of the trauma based stuff. Like I've only recently started talking about some of the abuse stuff on my podcast because it's, it's healed now. I've, I won't say you completely forgive, but you forgive yourself. You remove a lot of the shame. You remove a lot of the the story that you're unlovable. You remove a lot of the, all those internal belief systems that were at your core that were given to you by another human being who took advantage of you at a stage when you shouldn't have been taken advantage of in your early life. And you're able to let go of a lot of that. And once I was able to work through a lot of my heartbreak and my pain, because when you're, again, I'm speaking from focus group of one, but having those core wounds of being unlovable and not worthy of love. And then the person that you thought you'd be with forever leaves, it highlights it and magnifies it. And I had to work through a lot of that side. You know, Carl Jung talks about the shadow side that you need to work through the parts of your personality and your identity that you're not happy with. And I've long-term subscribed to his quote that your branches need to go down to hell or your roots need to go down to hell if you want your branches to reach up to heaven and going through these experiences and working through some of those core wounds and seeing that actually it wasn't my partner that her leaving was just the activation for this. This was all my stuff, my self-worth, my story, my issues. And when the ayahuasca was able to pave some of that path and what I needed to do to heal, I was able to move through a lot of it. Yeah, I love the work of Carl Jung. There's another quote as you're speaking that really resonates with me and speaks to this, I feel, is that until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. And what we're saying, what you said right at the outset to give your experience context was this this journey into your unconscious, into your subconscious, to to root around in there, to understand what the programming was, to get a sense of the narrative that was previously there, and to to give you an insight and knowledge to support you in actually changing those belief systems, to change that narrative, to change that story. What would you say was the profound outcome of the the recent experiences then the recent ayahuasca experiences what have you done to to change your belief system that kind of bringing this back almost full circle to change your belief system which has given you this incredible energy this incredible um creative burst uh this incredible psyche of service which has supported you actually in creating um you know a wonderful business to support business leaders can you share a little bit about that how the belief system brian before and brian now again with the hope of actually speaking to listeners who don't want to go on that journey but might be starting to get a little bit curious about what's actually going on in their subconscious there's lots of different methodologies and modalities to potentially get similar outcomes when people are stuck and not everybody's been through trauma. You know, everyone has their own issues and their own belief systems that they'll acquire and end up taking in from parental figures or father figures, mother figures, people who have teachers who have been through their life. And a lot of our belief systems are stuff that have been given to us. Like I always do the thought experiment when I'm my check-in for reactions with things is if it's hysterical, it's normally historical. If I disproportionate react to something, I normally go, right, that's hysterical because I'm reacting historically. And I ask myself, if I pressed a factory reset, like on my phone and took away all my experiences and biases and beliefs, would I react this way? And in a lot of cases, the answer is no. And there are things that you can get through therapy 
talk therapy, CBT, somatic therapy for body work in particular. You can work through your body, keeping the score and those traumas and experiences being stuck in your body and releasing some of them through some hands-on work and some physical work. That is a path and a modality that you can use. The advantage, poor choice of words, the option of plant-based medicines or psychedelics is it speeds that up. You get there faster. It's the same as driving from Galway to Dublin or Galway to Belfast in a little Honda Civic or going in a Ferrari. You're, you're, it's just the speed. The destination can be the same. The end results will be the same. Just the speed at which you get there will be different, whether you take a small little Toyota or whether you take a Honda Civic or you take a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. So that's the first thing I'll say in terms of an anchor here. Outside of that, the main takeaway for me was the belief system that the things we think that make us weak are actually the things that make us really strong. And I had a belief system for so many around different things in my life. Anxiety was another one. Mental health was another one. Things that I thought made me weak in reality make me very strong. I would argue part of the reason that I can connect with people and leverage some of my story is because I've been through some of these things firsthand. And there's things I won't talk about. I don't talk about alcohol addiction. I didn't have an alcohol addiction. That's not part of my story. There's other people who will resonate directly with that because it's part of their life, part of their experience, part of their story. But what this taught me was that we all have something in us that will help somebody. As business leaders, it tends to be bigger because business impacts more people generally. But it might be something as micro as how you show up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, husband or your wife or your son or your daughter. It might be more micro. And working through your stuff, and one of my mentors used to always tell me that if you don't heal your core wounds, you'll bleed on the people who didn't cut you. And I didn't want to go through the rest of my life bleeding on people who didn't cut me, whether that's my daughter, my future partner, God willing, if everything if I meet somebody else, my people that are closest to me in my life. And that worked as an anchor for me. It also makes me a better entrepreneur and a better business person because I can empathize now. I never, and you go through all my content and I've created an ungodly amount of content over the years. I have very little content. I have no content on heartbreak. I have no content on breakups or anything along those lines because I didn't experience that. That wasn't part of my story at the time. And I couldn't connect with people who did because I haven't lived it. And I got messages off the back because I did a few podcasts, but Pat Dively particularly, Jerry Hussey as well, where I was in a bad place when I was talking to them. And the only reason I took those podcasts was because I know those people and their friends and I knew they'd be able to hold the space because I was on the verge of tears for the whole episode. And I had men, more so men, message me who were going through breakups or going through divorces who felt like the world and the rug of the world had been pulled from underneath their feet. And I was just be able to say, look, I hear you. I feel you. I, it's horrible. This is, this is a horrible experience. And that became part of my story, which allows me to serve people in a different way. And I had the line and the quote, I'm a big man for a quote, as you can tell, Brendan. I love them, by the way. Don't yeah, I do. I love it's, them. it's my superpower. I didn't get super <laughs> strength. I didn't, I'm not able to fly or anything like that. I got an ability to retain a quote. But the one I had on my phone was, and I love this line. I don't know who it's attributed to, but just when the caterpillar thought it was the end of the world, the butterfly knew it was the beginning. And that was what I kept focusing on because I've long-term believed that what you focus on is what expands and you have to put in good things into your mind. You have to consume positive information. You know, don't plant apple seeds and expect oranges to grow is what I put in the book, Rewire Your Mindset. You can't consume negative content and expect to have a positive mindset. And that was something I doubled down on. And it's now became part of my core message when it comes to helping people move through struggle because I'm just able to empathize with it more. Yeah, I'm a big believer in kind of content directs your destiny. And, you know, you and I share that belief of, you know, leaders or readers and we choose the material that we allow to to come into our world. And that might sound 
that might sound negligent to others who say, well, how can you ignore what's happening out in the wider world? Well, I choose to do that because I'm not in control of any of that. But certainly from my perspective, if I can inspire, connect, enable ambitious leaders of small to medium-sized enterprise to scale with purpose, well, then you're creating these little ripples. And who knows, one of those companies, one of those leaders might be able to help some of those people in need on the other side of the world as a result of something we've done but i can't and i know i can't directly influence that and it will disrupt what we're trying to do um in the context of of our own work that's a little aside i'm i'm going to bring it back before we move into the close oh my goodness um <laughs> this is this needs a couple of parts, Brian, um, and I need to lie down. <laughs> <laughs> We've got super heavy, really quick, and I apologize. I was like, we'll, we'll throw out some jokes and stuff. I was like, no, let's go. Never super mind, heavy. never mind me needing to lie down. Are you okay? Do you I'm need good. to lie down? I couldn't uh, complain my... if I tried, Brendan. I am very fortunate with the way my life is, and I'm grateful for this conversation. So thank you. Oh, you're you're amazing. You're really amazing. And um, like in the middle of the night. And I've experienced this, experienced this a lot. You know, you get snagged on a thought and we can both intellectualize and say, yeah, what we focus on expands. But when it's three o'clock in the morning, you've woken up and there's, you know, there's been an angry exchange with, with a team member or, you know, a customer that you thought you would win has let you down. You haven't won and, and you get snagged in this at three o'clock in the morning. Now, I know that the best thing to do at that point is to, to choose another thought uh, but this thought just starts to grow legs and all of a sudden it's five o'clock and you haven't slept for the last two hours and you're about to get up in 15 minutes. And, you know, what do you recommend? Because I, su I suspect there's been a, quite a number of nights that you've experienced like that. Do you have peace now? You know, what do you recommend for people who, business leaders who are going on this scaling journey, who will relate to what I've just said and, uh, and maybe struggle with sleep for example we said sleep right at the outset was one of those significant pillars of bringing great energy how do we optimize great sleep especially given the facts that as business leaders our minds tend to be very full i wish there was an easy answer for this unfortunately i have the answer but equally unfortunate is it's not super easy to implement but i will share it as somebody that literally was the embodiment of that, where I would try and solve all the world's problems, business life at three o'clock in the morning. I, two things helped. One was journaling before bed. And what I've found similar to the check-in with motivation and alignment we talked about earlier was when I'm having recurring wake-ups or thoughts in my head for whatever reason, because of an action that I did take or an action or an inaction that I didn't take, normally getting that unprocessed thought onto a piece of paper before bed at least lets it to kind of sit there and it's outside of my head. I found that very helpful. The second thing was the meditation that I talked about earlier and not the meditation itself, although that could be helpful, the tool that meditation gives you. When you go into the gym and you squat or you bench press, it feels really awkward at the beginning, especially when you start to increase the weight. And then as you do it more, the weight feels lighter. It isn't lighter. The 20 kilos is 20 kilos. 30 kilos is 30 kilos. It's always the weight is objective and it's a, it's a weight that it's always going to be. But it feels lighter because you've got stronger with it. Meditation is quite similar when it comes to your approach to thoughts. You start detaching from those thoughts and realizing that you're not your thoughts. You're just a person or a, a, a vehicle that's having these thoughts come up. And what meditation does is it makes you stronger at disconnecting and detaching from those thoughts so that when they come up at three o'clock in the morning, you can choose, well, actually, I don't need this to grow legs right now. This is Brian and my human experience having this thought that's actually really unhelpful. I need to sleep because I've got a big meeting tomorrow and I need to be on it. And the more you practice meditation during the day or even before bed, the better you get with detaching from those thoughts that are going to potentially grow legs. And the analogy is like the bench press in the gym. The more you do it, the stronger you get, the easier it feels. Yeah, I love that. I love that analogy. Uh, you know, I always think that the 
the more you become distracted when you're meditating, the greater the opportunity to actually practice. That's getting your reps in. That's your that's your set of 10 bicep curls. You won't grow your arms if actually you're not lifting a weight and, and, and curling it. And when you're getting this distracting thought, you become aware of it and you bring yourself back, there's one rep. You know, you're sitting there for another 30 seconds, the th thoughts come again, you know, you bring it back, there's two reps. And that's, the more reps you can get in, the stronger you become. I think what for a lot of people, and certainly whenever I came to this for the first time, it was this notion that I'm going to sit down now and I'm not going to have any thoughts. And that's a nonsense <laughs> because you're going to have thoughts. But the reps are when you're able to become aware of those thoughts and actually bring it back then um, and not get snagged on those thoughts. So I love that. You've mentioned meditation. You've mentioned journaling. Um, to bring us to a softer close, can you describe to our listeners the kind of the non-negotiables in your daily routine? You know, so let's from from Brian Keane Wiggins up in the morning. What is what does your day look like? It's quite similar and has been for the last several years. I wake up around 6 a.m. or half six. I used to be a 5 a.m. club person. I've got better with giving my body the rest that it needs and prioritizing that sleep. So I get up a little bit later now. I work out first thing in the morning, fasted, normally five days a week. And that gives me a good anchor for my day. I normally train 50 minutes. I'll do sauna for 10, 20 minutes. And then I do my creative work first thing in the morning. So I block out a window of time, normally that nine to 11 window where I'll do creative work, whether it's book writing, if I'm in the process of writing a book, whether it's a solo podcast and recording a solo episode. And then after that, I'll have windows of time that I'll do all reactive work. Normally consultation calls now with my mentees and entrepreneurs or program based stuff where I'm checking in with people, just making sure everything's running smoothly. Anything I have to do with my team, I'll do it during this window. And then normally by six o'clock most days, I, I'm off and I switch off and I go do something fun or I'll hang out with my daughter or I'll go spend time with friends or I'll just have an evening where I'm taking it nice and chill and quiet and it varies but that's kind of my routine it's nothing too hectic I build in a lot of gray time or white space into my day because you know I remember reading Einstein's book the one that um his name is escaping me now. He did Da Vinci and Steve Jobs, uh, Walter Isaacson with Einstein. And he was talking about the transient hyperfrontality of the, where he'd sit and focus on a problem and then he'd go for a walk and then it would hit him and he'd go, oh, Eureka, E equals MC squared. Or I'm simplifying something that probably is a lot more detailed. But building in that white space for me is where I get those creative ideas. I very rarely come off a podcast or a section of a book and think, oh, that would make a great video or that would make a great reel or that would be a good chapter for a book. They normally come when I'm out with a walk for, with the dog or when I'm in the shower or when I'm just, you know, watching something on TV or watching live sports. I'll get these kind of eureka moments and inspiration is perishable. So I always capture it in my phone when it comes up, when those ideas come up. And then that's what I use to create stuff. I'm not looking at blank pages. I've got a section of a book partly written in my notes on my phone, or I've got an idea for a reel or for a video that I want to do, and I'm just pulling it out from my phone, and then I'm creating it when I sit down in that 9 to 11 creative window, and it's kind of just a rinse and repeat. Again, I've got much better balance with my life now. I have amazing family and friends. I spend more time with them and my daughter than I ever have, and I'm very grateful that I've got a very well-rounded life at the minute, but that's generally what my day looks like day to day, and then weekends are off, and it's normally live sport. I go to all the Galway football games. Like, I'm into life sport i'm into sport in general like i'll watch all the euros when the euros come on in the summer like that will be how i kind of unwind and detach completely um and it's just rinse and repeat really well by the time this episode comes out we'll know the result of the forthcoming arma galway game this weekend <laughs> uh, and i'm hoping for an arma win um just just coming back to a few things there uh, getting a little bit specific fasting how long do you fast for typically I have experimented with longer fasts. I've done everything up to 24 hour fasts, but generally just kind of a 10 hour to 12 hour fast works quite well for me. And to be honest, it's not strategically fasting because I've done a lot in the research around fasting. It just suits my schedule better and I train better when I'm fasted. So that's the reason I do it. Okay. So, you know, you have your, 
evening dinner at seven o'clock and maybe not eating till nine o'clock the next the next morning or whatever yeah. to give you the yeah. 12 hour fasting window mm -hmm. and um the your your exercise regime just i'm just curious what age are you now brian i'm 36 now 37 in december oh you're still ridiculously young um what what does your training look like have you have you started to think differently you know moving kind of from maybe uh, people i said to you the last time if you're listening to this when you get off this check out brian keen um google brian keen fitness and go to your images and you're gonna see the 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 body you you uh certainly i've aspired to for years um so as you know moving from kind of the vanity um look or the vanity muscles that we all aspire to as 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 young men growing up have you started to change or think differently about the way you exercise and what you're exercising for in your 30s or are you waiting until your 40s and 50s for that no 100 percent. it's changed dramatically in the last three or four years i do way more functional movement now than I did. I was very historically into a bro split where I would do my bodybuilding muscle, mirror muscle exercises. Or if I was playing, I played football most of my life, I was doing SNC, strength and conditioning style workouts. But there was always a, a either performance or aesthetic element to it. Now it's very functional. Now also my training doesn't stay the same all year round. It depends what I'm training for. Like I've got, I'm climbing Kilimanjaro, bringing a group up Kilimanjaro in October. Amazing. So so in, Oct in August, September onwards, it'll be a bit more hike based in terms of my training and just functional movements. At the minute, I'm doing shorter workouts, 40 to 50 minutes, very circuit based. So normally uh, a compound lift, a squat, a deadlift, a military press, normally a high intensity, like a rower in between and then like an ab core exercise and they'll circuit and I'll do that with multiple exercises. Um, but it changes depending on what I'm excited about training, similar to what I mentioned earlier. If I start to get that, oh my God, I feel a bit bored going to the gym. It's time to change up my training program or sign up for a race or sign up for something that gets that motivation going again. And then once you take action, the motivation comes with it. And I change it up regularly to make sure that I'm keeping the intensity level high and that I'm enjoying my actual training. Brian, any trends that are emerging uh, that you feel we should as business leaders we should be more curious about and um, and lean into certainly in in the last uh, i would say what more than five years now i wear an aura ring so i'm you know keen on tracking the stats they like it's incredible what they do and they're tracking resilience they've got a kind of this this health radar now they can uh, forecast potentially if you're going to be ill because of hrv heart rate sleep body temperature all of these things uh, so i've enjoyed the aura i'm maybe i there's maybe at times i need to just take it off and give myself peace but um because i find myself wakening up and going straight into the sleep app rather than actually tuning into well do you feel like you slept well you don't need the aura to tell you but are there any advances that you feel we should we should um uh, uh, take on board now that's 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 coming into the to the mainstream interestingly enough and i'm a big fan of aura rings and i wear a whoop as well i actually think we are going to start moving away from that i think we've over indexed on the data side of fitness and generally as a society from what i've experienced myself with my own 36 years of this planet but also with all the books that i've read we tend to go to an extreme over index and then we tend to go back the other side and then we find harmony and balance in the middle i think the tracking obsession which i like fitness my fitness pal uh sports watches garments whoops or rings i'm a big fan of them i'm a big data geek when it comes to fitness as well but i think we're over indexing on that i think we're a couple of years away from pushing the envelope too much on that and we'll end up going to the side where people are like just do it intuitively similar to the eating you know, like everyone was all about tracking calories for a while and now people are like look intuitively check in with your hunger signals and that's really good advice and we'll probably end up doing the fitness equivalent and then find harmony and balance in the next decade or a decade and a half but i think that's where it's going to move based on the history of the way that we tend to be as human beings and over reliance on 
data over reliance on AI, potentially now over reliance on robotics in general and machinery based learning in general. And I think this is just our version of that now. So I actually think we're going to probably come back more towards the intuitive side of fitness where it's like, well, actually, how did you sleep today? I slept pretty well. I don't need my aura ring to tell me that. Or how was my training session? It was pretty good. I don't need to check my whoop device. And I think that's what's probably going to be the trend, whether that's good, bad or indifferent. I don't have a strong opinion on it, but I do think that's probably what's going to happen. Before we move into the the traditional close for the show, is there anything, Brian, that we haven't covered today from a health and well-being perspective that you feel it's it's worth mentioning before we move into the close? I know, look, what I would say to people again, signpost people to, to your podcast. I mean, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of content there and all things health and well-being. So, but just broadly, is there anything that we haven't, covered today from a health and well-being perspective that you feel uh, that it's worthy of mentioning? The last thing I'll say on that, and it's an add-on to what we talked about, Brendan, is that yes, sleep is important, nutrition is important, important, movement's important, your circle and being around good people is important, but ultimately you have to be able to stick to the thing and the changes that you make and when it comes to things like your health, your wellness, your energy levels, you can listen to me, you can listen to Brendan, you can listen to hundreds, thousands of other experts out there, but ultimately it's square pegs into square holes. You have to try and find what's going to be a good fit for you. And we can offer a best practice or we can offer a best professional practice that works for lots of people. But if that doesn't work for you, you need to experiment with something different. I would just keep that in mind because sometimes it's too easy to get caught in an authoritative bias. And we assume that one person says this because they're in the profession that it's gospel and they have to follow it. When in reality, it's square pegs into square holes. You might be around peg and you need to experiment with different things to find what works for you oh brilliant advice which leads me l beautifully on to to my closing question and i knew you would have had a a wisdom packed last two years so i suspect these the answers to these questions may have changed can you share with our audience brian three timeless takeaways i have definitely changed in the last two years in terms of what the focus and the priority was because I remember this question in the last episode and I still believe all those in terms of how you look after yourself and your service to others etc something that I've been leaning into heavily that I mentioned and quoted earlier was reframing your story, particularly the story about what you think is your weakness is actually potentially your biggest strength. And if all that does is shift the narrative to a more positive place, it's worth checking in with and doing the experiment. The second one is also a quote that I mentioned here, and that is for those going through difficult times. And I love the Winston Churchill line that if you're going through hell, keep going. And if you are in what I call 2023, my caterpillar year, very difficult back into the year, I wouldn't wish what I went through in October, and November on my worst enemy, but I'm so grateful that I got to experience it and that I have more figurative color in my life now because of it. But if you are going through a difficult time right now, whether that's in your personal life or your business life, just remember that when the caterpillar thought it was the end of the world, the butterfly knew it was a new beginning. And the last thing I'll say, and this is a high-end message to myself, just be kinder to yourself. It's so easy as entrepreneurs, as business leaders, as business owners, as high-end executives to be beat yourself up because you didn't smash the last presentation or beat yourself up because you missed a sales target slightly, or beat yourself up because you didn't show up or you haven't got your work-life balance right, please just be kinder to yourself. As somebody that went through large portions of my life self-punishing for a whole host of reasons, but just couldn't give myself the kindness that sometimes I needed, nothing is ever better for you hammering yourself for it. Very rarely. But most things get better when you're a bit kinder to yourself. 
And sometimes you do need to kick up the ass and you need to go after something and get yourself to the gym because business is crushing it and you're out of shape. Yeah, that's different. You can give yourself a little bit of a a carrot and a stick approach, but in most cases, please just be kinder to yourself. And if you can move through this world, being kinder to yourself and a little bit kinder to others, you're going to have that peace of heart, that peace of mind, and you'll still have all the external successes. I thought you couldn't have both. I thought you couldn't have inner peace. I thought you couldn't have a calm mind and a successful external world in terms of the success when it came to revenue and money and business and external things. I now realize that was a story I told myself that was very untrue. And I'm trying to be a living version of that for others who potentially want to follow it themselves or who want to take clips of it to impart into their own life. And if that's you, know that you can have both. You can have the inner peace, the calm mind, the external success. And if anything, it just means you get all these things and you're more grateful for it and you don't live in a scarcity mindset and you shift into more of an abundant state. And that's the way you'll move through the world. Brian, at 36, uh, you have, I think of the, the little figurines that I had when I was younger, the, the action man body and the Charlie Munger mind. <laughs> Incredible wisdom. Um, in the vein of the message from the mother plant, what is next for you? I think I said this on the last episode, and I think it's become more clear now. I spent so much time, Brendan, constantly living in that I'll be happy win fallacy. I spoke about this in the Rewire Your Mindset book. Constantly focusing on a destination without ever checking in on the journey, on the journey, always on the outcome, not the process. In the last five years or so, I've got much better at the day-to-day, am I jumping out of bed excited? Am I excited for life? Am I excited to meet my friends? Am I excited to write this next book? Am I excited to work with this person? And as long as I'm able to consistently check in with that and be on that path, I don't really need to focus on what's next because it all becomes clearer. I've got my consultancy business. I'm climbing Kilimanjaro. I'm bringing a group up in October. I have other things that will be going on, I'm sure, towards the back end of the year and next year. But they're all things that just become next steps on the journey. So I don't focus on the next thing as much anymore. And whether that's right or wrong, it's definitely something that brings me more peace and I feel more aligned for doing it. Oh, brilliant. Well, look, I was hugely excited for this podcast today. I can't believe it's uh, it's almost two years since, since we last had you on. I knew it was going to be a good one, but my God, it's uh, it's been phenomenal, Brian. I really, really appreciate you showing up. I really appreciate as I mentioned earlier, your openness, your vulnerability, your willingness to to share selflessly. Uh, you just bring so much insight, so much incredible wisdom for such a young, young guy. I wish you every success because you deserve it, my friend. And um, look, if people want to to connect with you, if they haven't heard who Brian Keane is, which I cannot believe if they haven't, but if they want to connect with you, Brian, how, how can people hear more about what you're doing and, um, and, and, and reach you on across the, the various platforms? Oh, firstly, thank you so much for the beautiful words, Brendan. I've loved this interview and your ability to hold the space to be able to go into some of the topics we covered. I just want to commend you on your, not only your interviewing ability, but also your being that kind of person who could hold that space. So just a thank you for me for allowing me to go into that. For anyone that wants to follow me, I'm on all the social media channels. Instagram is probably a bit the best one, Brian underscore Keen underscore fitness. And then the podcast, which is my baby. Like, again, the thing that I love doing, I jump out of bed in the morning to get to chat to the people I get to chat to. Um, I would definitely check that out as well. Podcast listeners tend to listen to podcasts. So definitely check that out and see if there's anything on there that will help you on your journey. <laughs> You're an absolute star, my friend. The next time we're going to do this in person. So look, in the meantime, look after yourself. Take care. 100%. Thank you so much again.